step anytime you preach, turn on microphone. So it is good to be here. My name is Scott Thomas. Uh, me and my family, we've been at East Hill 12 years this month. And it's amazing. Um, I think after first service, I met 20 people at least that I still had never met. <laughs> it's amazing how we can kind of come and go and still so many people we haven't had contact with. Um, but thankful that you're finding your people here. Thankful you're part of the family. Welcome. Um, Sharon and I, my wife, who I don't know if she's still here. She was here first service. Um, we've served on the prayer team over the years, been a part of um, Alpha and um, directed some new believers classes for a number of years. Still see a handful of people interspersed that came through that after accepting Christ. But yeah, it's just, it's, it's great to be here. We're so thankful to be in a church where our gifts are fanned into flame. And make no mistake, there is ample opportunity for you to step out from where you are and find a place to, to serve in our church family. And especially this next week with the children, if you haven't already signed up. Um, we came to East Hill in a difficult season 12 years ago, immediately following uh, me stepping down from full-time ministry to address brokenness in my life, to threaten my marriage. Um, and it's been a powerful, powerful journey, and we are eternally thankful for this place, uh, for Harry Flanagan, who was here for a service, people that have just helped to restore our lives. And, and this morning, uh, we're going to get into Scripture, but, but it's a story of a second restoration um, in my life, a lot of testimony um, around the Scripture as well as I share what God's done in my life here in the last year, year and a half. Um, but I just want to give um, kudos to my friend Keith here on the front row. Um, over the last two months, and, and I call him Keith because he's my brother, and he's, he's the son of God. And we've been, we've been tracking a journey over the last month and a half with a couple of other friends, Eric and Andy, just coming back to the heart of the Father and making sure that we're living and resting in that place where we find ourselves in the arms of a loving Father. And I'm so thankful, Pastor Keith, for pulling me into that journey with you. Um, the second part, I don't, yes, I'm happy about. But uh, so you'll hear a lot more about this here in a minute. But over the last year and a half, I have fought a battle, a uh, very significant battle against cancer. So I'm sitting about a month and a half ago in an oncology waiting room, waiting for a follow-up appointment with my doctor. And I had some interaction with Keith the night before. And he asked me, there were a couple other texts I think that came in before it, but just one question popped out. And he said, what is on your heart for our people? I'm like, I'm like, okay. I love you, buddy, but that's your job. <laughs> I mean, that's my instant reaction. He, he, he's got it. He's, he's got it. He shares his, the Father's heart with you with power week after week after week. I love the way he preaches, teaches, and leads us. But, but to be asked that is just a volunteer in the church. What's on my heart for, for this family that I love? That's a big question. Um, um, and then they called me back for my appointment, so I had 45 minutes <laughs> to think about it. I'm like, oh, thank you, God. Deliverance. I can, I can think. I don't need to, like, have something right now. But it's funny. I took the time and then drove home, and, or actually right before the drive home while I'm sitting in the parking structure. I shared with him what was on my mind the moment he asked me because God confirmed that was it. It was just the simple words, abide in me and I will abide in you. And it flows out of testimony of what God had to bring me back to this last year. Uh, powerful, painful, a lot of hurt involved in it. But I believe it's timely for us today. Um, so getting into it, about 17 months ago, uh, I had some symptoms, didn't think much about it, went to urgent care. They gave me some antibiotics, said, ah, you'll be Okay. Then they gave me some stronger antibiotics and said, oh, you, you'll be okay. I wasn't okay. <laughs> and I started freaking out, reading the symptoms, and I think I have cancer. I think I have cancer. And I called my primary care physician. Thankfully, amazingly, he called me back. Doesn't always happen in the system I work with. Um, and he said, oh, yeah, man, you're, you're 49 years old. That disease is something that 79-year-old men get. 
in, in men. I mean, everyone can get it, but it, you don't have any of the risk factors. Well, lo and behold, here two weeks later, uh, while sitting in a doctor's office, I find out I have bladder cancer. And, and not just a little bitty bladder cancer, but bladder cancer that's going to take some significant um, chemotherapy, surgery, and rebuilding, tearing down <laughs> and rebuilding. And, and I'm just, I'm already in a situation in my life where I'm praying for deliverance from my job. <laughs> this is not the kind of deliverance I was asking for, God. <laughs> I mean, I, in fact, I'll share this. I didn't share this first service. I had said to my boss when I came back after doing something else, I said, I'll come work for you, but I'm only staying nine months. January 1st, I'm gone. I mean, I made an agreement with myself. God, you're going to honor this, I hope. But it was basically just saying, this is what I'm going to do, and I'm going to do this. And then instead of deliverance to something newer or better, it was, Scott, we're sorry, but you have cancer. And I, I was, to say the least, devastated. Um, and God found me in that time, and um, through this season has brought me back to a place of abiding in him. If you have your Bibles, feel free, pull them out on your phones, follow along. Or if you actually have a physical Bible with you, amen, <laughs> pull it out. It's going to be on the screen as well. But the passage we're going to be in is from John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word of God, which, have I, which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. So neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. <clears throat> For apart from me, you can do nothing. And the key verse here, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. Let's pray. Father, I thank you this morning for this magnificent opportunity just to come and share your heart with your people. Lord, I, I don't take this lightly. But Father, I sense the heart <clears throat> that you're speaking over your people, as, as Andrew said this morning, it's just a time to lean into you. Lord, many of us are coming, we're hurting. We're walking through seasons we never would have wished upon ourselves. And we desperately need a touch from you. Father, help us to lean into you and hear your heart for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So I've got a new reality I've got to live out. And it's, it's called cancer. <laughs> um, I, I'll give you just kind of the short journey. Well, first, the shock. Um, I, I was no stranger to cancer. I've basically been um, exposed to cancer all of my life. Uh, my grandmother, who was basically a second mother to me, especially when I had a single mom uh, for a number of years before she remarried, uh, she was diagnosed with cancer about the time I was born, and I watched her fight a battle of breast cancer for 13 years till I was in middle school, and she passed away. Um, and years later, as I was working in youth ministry, my mom um, had her first bout of breast cancer uh, when, she was, when I was 30 years old. Another bout at 40 years old. And then finally, three years ago, right before Christmas, uh, we found out she had pancreatic cancer, and she was gone in five weeks. Um, so just a, a lot of battle that I've seen. <laughs> None of them connected, you know, maybe grandmother and mom. But then a month and a half before I was diagnosed with cancer, <clears throat> my grandfather, who's 96 years old, reaches out to me and says, Hey, Scott, I just need to let you know um, I have mouth cancer and bladder cancer. And, um, you know, be praying for me, but we're going through treatment. The man went through 45 radiation treatments. Uh, changed his life drastically. Um, he's not able to eat anything by mouth anymore. Um, everything is through feeding tubes. And here this last Tuesday, I called and celebrated his 98th birthday with him on the phone. I got pictures. 
I got pictures, um, and he's living vibrantly. He's got a walker. Um, I've got pictures of him last week or the week before his birthday. He's out uh, at the track at a college that he built. He put the money forward. It's the Frank Patton track in North Carolina. Over 100 high school, middle school students were there for a track meet. And there's Grandpa with the starter pistol <laughs> picking off. I mean, he's living. He's leaning in, and he's walking through everything. And so I made at least one agreement early in cancer, the cancer journey that I was going to faithfully walk through every single treatment the doctor said. I was going to trust the doctors. So that meant the chemotherapy, a 10-hour surgery, which is about a year ago, March, no, sorry, April 6th, um, about the only date I remember the whole journey. 10 hours, two transfusions, amazingly made it through a surgery that, as Lori Hill would say, it was like four surgeries in one. They just, I won't give you the details, um, but it nearly cost me my life. Spent 10 days in the hospital, and I came home, and the reality that I chose was that um, I didn't want to die in bed next to my wife. I, I had prepared myself because I'd seen so much of it to go home and see Jesus. As Andrew said, it's over here, <laughs> um, I'm sure of heaven and I'm sure of God's love for me. And I just kind of decided early on, I'm probably going home and I'm ready. And so I, I made a choice. I was sleeping on a mattress in the living room when I came home from surgery because I didn't want to die in bed next to my wife and have her to deal with that. Uh, she's a trauma mental health therapist. I don't need to add to her trauma. Again, not my choice, but this is what big boy, I'm going to do it all myself, decided. I'm going to protect everybody from my pain journey. So I, I was separating. Without noticing it, I was pulling back from people. Um, I couldn't because my immune system was so broken down. Thanks, Seth. Um, because my immune system was so broken down, I, I couldn't be here at church. We watched as much as we could online. Uh, but I missed community but at the same time, I would, um, I would see people from church out and about the rare time so that I went out. And I just break down weeping because I, I missed that community. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, so about three weeks after my surgery, I'm on my couch, living room, my new existence, and just, you know, praying that Jesus take me home, to be honest with you. And my wife comes in, takes my temperature, and it's like 103.6. And um, she says, grab some clothes, grab some shoes. And she says, put these on, we're going to the ER. And I said, yeah, I'm good, I'll just sleep it off. <laughs> and um, she said, no, we're, we're going now. And that night, my wife saved my life. We got to Kaiser Sunnyside ER. Ten minutes later, I had a bed and um, was in ICU for five days um, as they saved my life from a massive blood infection. Um, I am so thankful for my wife and her, her help. And again, we'll get to that <laughs> in a minute. Um, all that to paint a picture of the desperation of, I didn't know it yet. I was just, you know, I set out the life insurance policies. I gave Sherry the login to all the financial accounts. I was assured she and the kids would be set up. And I was basically just quietly checking out and saying, it's okay. God loves me. I'm going home. I'm going home. Let's get into the word. The first statement that Jesus makes that I want to call out in this, John chapter 15, verse 1. Jesus says, I am the vine. This is one of seven statements in the book of John. I am statements in the book of John that Jesus makes. Number one, I am the bread of life. Two, I am the light of the world. I am the door for the sheep. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the good shepherd. I am the way, the truth, and the life. We know the other part. Nobody comes to the Father but by me. And then finally, here we are. Jesus is the vine. Jesus shared this teaching with his disciples. Abide in me, and I will abide in you. And just for context, it was the days in between the triumphant entry, as we know as Palm Sunday, today, and the crucifixion, which we know 
as Easter. Timely, timely teaching. I did not know that, by the way, when PK asked me what was on my heart <laughs> to share, um, that that was like where the scripture fell. So again, divine providence in that moment. But looking back at Palm Sunday, the triumphant entry, do you know what the people were celebrating when they celebrated Jesus' entry into the city of Jerusalem? They weren't standing there celebrating, hey, we're going to put this guy on the cross. Many of us cast judgment on him, and he's going to die for our sins. No, they were expecting Jesus to come into the city, to be enthroned as the king of Jerusalem, and deliver them from their oppressors. They had a different story in mind than the reality of what the Father's will was in that moment. Anybody else identify with him? I got got a different plan, God. I'm going to leave this job. I I don't want this disease. I don't want this broken marriage. I don't want my kids to be wandering off from what you have for them, but I can't control it, and they are. God, you've got a different reality right now, and I got to press into you to find my place in it because I'm, I'm not at rest. I'm not at peace. I'm not following what you're doing. I need to lean in to Jesus in those moments. Jesus, <laughs> he didn't just teach it, but he lived it. In the Garden of Gethsemane, hours before he would be judged, you remember what his prayer was? Maybe you've never heard it. Father, if you were willing, remove this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. Father, if you can, can you find another way? But nevertheless, your will be done. This was not in any way a flippant prayer. Jesus was in severe, severe pain. Luke, the doctor, describes it in his account. Jesus was sweating as drops of blood onto the ground, meaning the capillaries, the vessels around his sweat glands, due to extreme stress, were popping, and blood was mixing with his sweat and falling to the ground. Jesus struggled. Jesus suffered with this question of will, the will of the Father, much as we do. This isn't a shame game. I, I've had friends approach me and say, Scott, hey, wait, you know, the cancer journey's hard. Maybe you're being a little hard on yourself. I assure you, I extend myself grace. I eat a lot of chocolate. <laughs> I, I find ways, I watch a lot of comedy for therapy. I, I watch a lot of sports. I, I celebrate good things that lift my spirit but I'm willing to admit when there's something missing and there's something broken in my faith. And this cancer journey helped me to discover it. Um, Jesus was all about doing the will of the Father. He didn't stop the prayer as he could have. You know, the the story, in some of the accounts here, the story of uh, Peter when the guards came to arrest Jesus in the garden shortly after that prayer, Peter takes his sword and he's like, I'm not letting this happen. And what does he do? He takes a swipe at a guard and lobs off his ear. Now, if I'm Jesus, and I'm not, thank you, everyone. <laughs> um, I'm going to take that as a sign to run. Hey, well, we got a war on our hands. Let's take off. Let's run for cover. Jesus steps up, picks up the ear and reattaches it. Says, hey, stand back, draw down. It's okay. I've got this. Again, surrendering to the will of God in the moment of his most extreme stress and pain. The second declaration Jesus makes in this passage, you are the branches, John 15, 5. The branch is connected to the vine. It must be to thrive. David understood this, King David. One of my favorite verses, um, Psalm 27, favorite chapter, but key in on these verses, Psalm 27, verse 4 and 5. One thing I have asked of the Lord, that shall I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and meditate in his temple. 
For in the day of trouble, he will conceal me in his tabernacle. In the secret place of his tent, he will hide me. I just picture him just cradling him. He's going to hold me. I got to let him. It's hard to pick up a big boy like this. I, I got to let him. He wants to hide me, and he wants to lift me up on a rock. And again, just for context in this, David, I don't know exactly when this chapter was written, but through this journey, David was anointed king of Israel. There is only one problem. Saul was already the anointed king of Israel. We got a little problem on our hands here. Uh, So David is fearing for his life. And I'm not talking again like Jesus, not in a little way. If he's in the same room with Saul, there were several times that Saul would literally chuck a spear at David's head to try to kill him. Luckily for David, Saul didn't have David's aim. (laughs) You know what I mean there, Goliath. Um, (laughs) So, and then there's this one occasion where David is hiding in a cave from the armies of Saul, which are seeking to kill him. Here's the kind of prayer he's praying. One thing, no, the one thing I'm asking is kill that guy, (laughs) kill Saul. No, the one thing he's asking of the Lord is that he could dwell in the presence of the Lord. Where's the selfish prayer? It's not, it's not there. David is praying the will of the Father. He had opportunity while he was hiding in the cave one day when dozens of Saul's men with Saul come in to sleep in the same cave David is hiding in. He could have taken Saul's life in the darkness that night. Instead, he cuts off a piece of his robe, holds it up. He's like outside the cave the next day. He's like, I could have taken you last night but I didn't. This is up to the Father, and I'm going to trust in him. Oh, to have that kind of faith as we are branches of God, and we're building off of Jesus and who he is. So I've shared with you a little bit of my, um, I I spent 16 years in full-time ministry before stepping down to heal some broken parts of my life in other ways. Um, I've leaned in through the years heavily to just regrowing spiritual formation and investing into helping men and others grow in their faith and discipleship. I like to think that I got things pretty handled pretty well in my faith journey. Well, sometimes it just takes a conversation <laughs> to show us where we're broken. Anybody ever had one of those conversations that just, oh, daggers, daggers to the heart, transformation happens. So this fall, Again, no concept of time in my brain right now with everything I walked through. Uh, My wife sits me down on the couch and she says, hey, I need to have a talk with you. Uh, I've been working really hard. This is her. I've been working really hard and uh, I'm going to take a sabbatical in uh, the spring or summer of 2025. And I want to take a trip to England and Scotland. I traced a bunch of my genealogy back there. I've always wanted to see it. And um, She says... um, so yeah, I'm, I'm going to do that. I want to do that. How do you feel about that? I'm like, absolutely, go for it. Go, yeah, I'm, I support you. She's like, no, 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 you're missing it. I said, I want us to do it. And I, I, just, I just start breaking down. I'm like, woman, what, what are you asking of me? I, I'm angry even a little bit at her. I said, do you not understand the spot where I'm living right now? Every three months, I got to take tests to tell me if there's more cancer in my body. I got one of those in a couple weeks. Um, I can basically live two weeks at a time right now. I can't think about a year and a half. So when you tell me you want to go to Scotland, England, I say, take a month off work, have fun. I may not be there. Again, I'm not on this journey with God. I'm praying, honestly, the first half of Jesus' prayer. God, Father, if at all possible, take this cup from me. But if you're not going to take the cup from me, just take me. That's how my prayer is ending. It's not ending with, God, if that's not possible, your will be done. I'll be honest, I'm not, I hadn't been praying that prayer. And it didn't dawn on me till the next words came out of my mouth. I said, honey, I know you, you married this crazy, wild dreamer. This guy that always has his feet three, four feet off the ground, 
floating with helium balloons to the next dream that God's placed in my heart, trying something new. I love you, but that guy's dead. I, I said these words, just like, that guy's dead. I don't know. I don't know how to hope anymore. I don't know how to hope anymore. And it was done. And she, she backed off for a bit. She, she wasn't buying it. She wasn't going to let this guy die. But again, I'm a verbal processor, highly ADHD. First time I'd ever heard myself say it. And over the next few weeks, I realized, no. <laughs> I've been letting him die. But that guy's not going to die. That guy's not going to be gone. I need something that I'm missing. I need to finish up this prayer. God, if at all possible, it's beyond that. I'm rebuilt on the inside now. I've been through chemo that's messed up my body in some ways. You know, they tell you after chemo, well, with chemo, you're going to lose your hair. So the good thing about that was um, I'd lost it 20 years before. One of the side effects, however, is that sometimes your hair can grow back differently. So again, I'm praying, God. <laughs> so you're saying there's a chance. <laughs> I didn't get it. I didn't, I didn't, yeah, no. That didn't happen. Yeah. But true transformation began to happen. It wasn't a journey of shame. It was a journey of realizing that I'd been living a journey on my own, trying on my own power to put the weight on my shoulders and fix myself. I got this. I'm going to get through this. I'm going to be like my grandpa, I'll go through all my treatments and be okay. He's a man of faith too. <laughs> I, I sat with um, a dear new friend, a um, former professor from a lot of years ago who uh, two months before me, started the cancer journey and has just finished up all of his treatment and he's cancer free right now. Uh, but Dr. Gary Brashears, I sat in his living room, the man lives a half mile from me and I never knew it. Um, and, and we were sharing and I just said to him, Gary, I, I'd, like to, I, I'd like to have thought I could fight like you thought. And, and I watched him month after month posting on his blog and posting his faith and posting um, and sharing the gospel through teaching deep theology to people across the country and engaged with his giftedness. And I wish I could take back time and have been living the fruit of God in my life. But I'm telling you, the suffering overtook. I would run into, <laughs> I shared first service, uh, I went to farmer's market, one of my first outings, my wife said, you need to walk. Um, so early summer, we, we get out of the house, and, and we're walking around the farmer's market, and I ran into Andrew and Elise. And, and I just started weeping. And, and I didn't know why. And they're probably going, dude, this guy, is, woo, he's broken. <laughs> uh, they didn't say that, and I know they didn't think that. Um, I didn't know what was broken then. I'm like, man, I know I'm an emotional guy, but I'm crying a lot. I ran into Eric a week later as his daughter and my son graduated from Reynolds at um, the venue that we were at, and again, just broken in tears. And I probably didn't realize even till this week what that was about. And what it was was here I was at home saying, God, just take me home. God, just take me home. And then I'm running into these wonderful people who have meant so much to my kid's life and my life. And I'm like, I want to be back around them. I, I want to live my best life. Come on. And when you admit <laughs> that guy is dead and I have no hope, I killed the wrong guy. <laughs> Come on. I mean, Come on. I, That's good. the Bible tells us to kill our flesh, not kill our hope. Mm. I needed to turn it around because God had saved me. I stand here today. There's not any cancer in my body. Um, on, and that's his. <laughs> Um, on the, the 8th, just about 10 days from now, I'll have my final immunotherapy treatment. Um, I won't try going into with you the side effects of cancer and treatment. There was one time that I was taking 30 different kinds of pills per day. <laughs> I, ludicrous. Like, yeah, I just, I, I hated the journey. But God wants me to live my best life. And he's involved. 
Third part, uh, God, our Father, is the vine dresser. Now, I watched a lot of videos on what that means to be a vine dresser because, you know, I, I don't, you read it in the scripture and you pass it over. What does that mean? He's the vine dresser. Um, it means that, I didn't realize this, like every year, I, I would have thought vineyards just continue to grow and get big, but man, they chop them back down to the vine every year. They chop it back down to where there's nothing but Jesus, if Jesus is the vine, right? And our branches are paired back, so everything is just coming straight out of the vine again. Um, I decided one thing, I will never grow <laughs> grapes because it is a lot of work. <laughs> uh, I love the effects of grapes. Did I say that? Not the effects, the taste. Okay. Um, <laughs> let's not, let's not. <laughs> hmm. Oh, Stepped into that one. <laughs> Woo! Syrah, by the way, if anybody wants to gift. Um, but it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work to be the vine dresser. God, what that says to me is he is intricately involved. From 1 Peter, therefore humble, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that, may, that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Now, again, painting a picture for you as I did first service, he cares for you doesn't mean, oh, yeah, I care for him. It means I care for you. I'm coming, and I'm actively working with you, and I'm, I'm re-gearing and re-guiding these vines. Anybody ever worked with blackberries before? Okay, we're in the Pacific Northwest. If you are a property owner, you've worked. I mean, I love my weed whacker. It's battery powered. It will go forever, and it's just going to chop everything down. That's not how God's working with us. He's not like me. Again, thank you. He's coming, and he's making clips in the right places. And he's tending to our lives in ways, again, that we may have never chosen for ourselves. But he's actively involved. When he says he cares for us, he's tending to us. He's active with us. Be of sober spirit, be on alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. But resist him. Firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. And he brings it home. After you have suffered for a little while, the God of grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be dominion forever and ever to him be the praise because he is restoring, rebuilding, fixing what is broken in us. How does he do that? He does that in me. Man, I'll tell you, I, there's a lot of things. I love a lot of music. I won't tell you the genres and things I like, but you know what, what speaks to me and what transforms me? One guess, worship. I, I have to turn on my music and my streaming to worship when I find myself dipping because I desperately need to be connected to the vine. So worship, just giving praise to God, like the end of this, to him be dominion forever and ever, amen. It focuses me back on who he is. The word, it speaks to me every day as I engage, not just when Pastor Keith and Jan and Randy are sharing with us and sharing about the fruit of the spirit over the last few weeks. It's, it's powerful to have somebody preach to you and I love it, but it's not everything. That's right. We have to have our own interaction with the word and by that, the person of God. John chapter one, I am the word. Jesus saying that, he is the word, he is interacting with us and the word challenges, changes, penetrates, transforms our lives. One of the most powerful visuals I've ever seen in my life of the word and transformation. Um, when I was in seminary, Fuller Seminary in Pasadena, one of my mentors just by book, and then finally I'm getting a chance to meet him in this classroom. And I'll be honest, he's a nerd. Like he's, he's, he's you know, just, he's not like a guy that stands up front all the time and, and speaks and shares, and he's got this great personality. He's just really meek and really quiet. And he walks in with this box and he sets it down. And one of the students, before he can even get to it, like, hey, what's in the box? Um, and he says, these are my Bibles. 
He's like, why, why do you need so many Bibles? He goes, no. One, each one of these Bibles represents a year in my life. Every year, I get a new Bible. And that way, and I got it marked on the margin here. See, this is, this is 2000, when I was walking through the death of my father. And I can turn into those pages and see what God was doing in that season. The Word and how it transforms and changes. I love it that the Word is available to us on our iPads, our iPhones, the internet, everywhere. But are we maybe missing something when, when we don't erect these monuments, these, these things that we can pull back out and touch and see and remember? This is where God interacted for and cared for me. Yeah. i got to remember that in my time of suffering. I've got to know that he is close. He is leaning into you. He's biting you to come and rest in him. The thing is, he's not going to overpower you. He's not going to come and say, hey, get in my lap. <laughs> Before she, like my grandpa used to do. It's like, dude, get off me. <laughs> it's like, he's going to say, come. And because you love him, you're going to run into his arms. And we get to see those interactions if we journal, as we do our prayer journals as we get in the Word. And then the other area that he uses, especially in my life, is people. God uses people to transform me. And I don't know why. I'm, I'm like I shared, I'm crazy ADHD. It's amazing. I can even keep the flow of this message. I love technology. It's changed my life. It keeps me in order. Or I'd be whew, all over. But I can remember pretty much every single powerful, profound conversation I've ever had. Not just what words were shared, but where I was sitting, where I was driving, where I was standing, and the context of my life that I was walking through when that thing was shared for me. The first one I'll share was when I sat in Harry Flanagan's office a decade ago, picking up the broken pieces of my life. And Harry looked at me and he said, Scott, the most broken thing in you isn't your addiction and your marital struggles. The most broken thing in you is that you're emotionally anorexic because nobody knows authentically who you are. You don't let anybody in. I got my car, wife next to me, we're leaving this first counseling appointment to rebuild our marriage and her trust in me. And I said to her, I'm never going back. I do not like that guy. He's a crock. He, doesn't, he possibly can't know that I have 1,400 Facebook friends. <laughs> Nevertheless, she persisted and said, that's fine. You don't go back. You don't go back to the house either. I love this woman. Um, I do. I really do. Um, I love it. He was here praying over me for a service before we started during worship. There is no more profound relationship in my life than, than Harry Flanagan because he showed me the love of Christ for a very, very broken man and helped to rebuild me. And that, to me, again, a monument. This wasn't just Harry. This was God vine dressing, vine tending, transforming my life through Jesus with skin on. A few months later... After hiding out here at East Hill for three years, worshiping and bawling my eyes out every time we worshiped, no joke. I mean, I'm just broken every time. Why am I so broken? God, when can I be back in ministry? Ah, my life sucks. <laughs> just be honest. And it was my, my take. And I go to life group, and we were at Roger and Deanna's house. First time I've been in a home group at East Hill. And we're sitting there, and... Keith and Kathy and Roger and Deanna, they had heard my story. They knew my battle wounds, my mistakes, my errors. But there was another couple I hadn't met yet. And Keith goes, hey, Scott, why don't you share a part of your story with them? I'm like, oh, this. Be authentic. Okay, Harry. Emotionally anorexic. Let people know you. And I shared some of my scars, some of my mistakes. And as I'm sure in this guy that must not have been in his right mind at all, He's sitting there, straight across from me. He's leaning in, and he's smiling. And he's just listening. And what I'm seeing in his eyes is acceptance, is the love of Christ, is no judgment. And we're here for you, and you're part of this community. 
I'm so glad you're here, Scott, and we support you. And we got in the car after that one. <laughs> and I said to my wife, I need that man in my life. I need people that are going to lift me up and not judge me because I spend all of my life judging myself. And I've got to rebuild to the heart of God. People, the word, worship. These are some of the most profound ways that God is rebuilding us and building us and transforming us and tending to us to make us more like him. If we're missing out or, I can't, anemic of one of those, we're missing out on the profound power of what God wants to do in us. Hem in to community. Hem in to the world, to the word. I grew up under this guy named Arlen Hills Youth Ministry. When he stepped down to become an electrician, I replaced him. The thing I remember since I can remember anything with Arlen walking around the church was he's always worshiping. He's always worshiping, always singing. There's always a song. And, and at first I was annoyed by it. Dude, we're cutting grass. Why are you worshiping? <laughs> we're, we're fixing a toilet in the church <laughs> because that's what youth pastors did in that church. You fix toilets, you mow the lawn, you did all of it. Um, we do all of it. But worship, people, that's the profound power of what God wants to do in us is hem us in, and we need those to rebuild. And then finally, every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, John 15, verse 2. But the fruit of the Spirit, and what is this fruit? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. Against these things, there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So how do we find out if we're disconnected from the vine? I found out because I uttered the words. I got no hope. I got no hope. That guy is dead. And when I recognized it, it started me to turn. What of these are you finding lacking in your life today? Is the enemy stealing your joy? Is a diagnosis stealing your joy? Is a family member and a broken relationship stealing your joy and your hope? Then graft back in to him. Because the suffering, yeah, it's going to last a little while. And we may, may not have ever wished it upon ourselves but there is something profound and powerful that is happening on us that only happens in times of stress and suffering. We find those broken places in our lives and Jesus calls to us to rebuild in him. Finally, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. Let's stand together as we close. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. And I don't know who it is here today, but you're, I know you're here. And you're praying like I did the first half of that prayer and you're saying, God, if at all possible, remove this cup from me. Take it, take it. I can't bear it anymore. And there's still time. Keep praying that by all means. But others of you, you're walking in it and you're walking through it and you're suffering, but you're refusing to pray. Nevertheless, God, your will be done. Is it just me? Anybody else in the house today? Just signify by a raised hand that I need to lead into the suffering. I need to lean in. I don't like this. I had about six people walk up to me and tell me their diagnosis from the last month today. And I prayed for them on the spot, and I always will. But lean in. Lean in to this time because God is for you, and he's raising you up, not just to heaven. We hope he stops before then. But he's lifting you to him. How many of you are hearing what the Lord is saying mm -hmm. through Scott and your hope has been diminished and it's hard for you to expect that God will be good. Lift your hand right now. 
Here's what I want you to do. I want you to come right here, right now. Come right here, right now. Come right here, right now. We didn't do this in the first service, and I think it was a miss. I hesitated. Come on. There are others of you. I can feel it all around me. It's in my bones. Whether it be relationships, financial, whatever it is, beyond your ability, you need to pray over them. Lord, we just cry out to you this morning. If you guys all could, all of us just raise our hands, both hands to the Lord as a sign of surrender. Father, we have found the end of ourselves and we unashamedly admit it this morning that we are powerless right now to move forward alone in this pain, in this struggle, in this burden, in this diagnosis, in this relationship. Father, we need you. We cry out to you. Father, we ask you this morning to come alongside us. Your Holy Spirit, the comforter. Your Son, the Word, our guide. And your Father, the loving arms wrapped around us, holding us tight, telling us and whispering us, whispering in our ears, I got you. I got you. We need to hear it this morning. I'm enough for you. Lord, hold us. Lord, draw us close to you that we would celebrate as we come through this battle, not because of anything that was accomplished by our own power, but because we surrendered to the most holy God and he cared for us and held us and let us weep and break down and didn't judge us, but lifted us up in our spirits. And Father, in that place, the fruit of his testimony, the fruit of his power was restored in our lives. Lord, I speak hope. I speak peace. I speak restoration. And Lord, by all means, we speak healing over each of these situations here today. Guard us, Lord. Hold us tight in you. In Jesus' name, amen. And 